we are very happy to have. <laughs> we are very happy to have Matteo Capucci, who will be telling us about games with cats. Hey, hi everyone! Thanks for uh, having me here. It's been a real pleasure to be here at Topos for a week, and I'm looking forward to the next week as well. Um, today, I want to talk you to talk to you about game theory. And since we are doing applied category theory, I'm going to talk you, to you about the way that we at Strifefly are developing a categorical framework for ca game theory, right? So as you can see from this loading bar, we're not there yet, almost there. So there's going to be, I think, a disappointing conclusion to this talk in which I'm like hand-waving stuff. It's like, oh, we have to understand how this fits together. But we're definitely getting there, and the story is interesting enough to be told already, I think. Um, so the story has been like brewing for many years, actually. So if you're not familiar with open games, uh, this is something that Jules had just like, invented in 2015 by now, so it's seven years. And since then, there's been many developments, many applications, and uh, Jules and other people are working on an actual implementation in Haskell, and, and so on and so on. But like re very recently, in the last two years, we ha we've seen like a fast and like overhaul uh, development of the framework. So I want to tell you basically what I think is the new outlook for open games, like what they look like right now and what I think they're going to look like the same in, a, in a, a year from now. So. First, I want to give you some motivational like uh, words why we're doing this. Um, especially like I was with Bruno the whole week, and he was preparing this talk to give to people doing machine learning, right? And he has to convince them to learn category theory and to do machine learning with category theory. So we're in these discussions like how how can we communicate like this wonderful language that we have, and like we should have people come and join us in using these tools to actually like do machine learning or in my case game theory or whatever y you think it's important to do and so usually people like stress compositionality and indeed like open games has been sold as compositional game theory for a long time and i think the way i look at this is a bit more ambitious so i think the categorical game theory is like studying the structure of games, which has been neglected for most of the story, history of game theory. So it's not just understanding how you can compose games to get bigger games, but it's understanding, and, and this is something that like in the last two years I've been really, really seeing happening in my understanding, is like improving the way we understand what game theory even means. Like what are the systems we're studying? Uh, what does it mean to study competing agents, what does it mean to cooperate, what does it mean to uh, like optimize your payoff, what is even a payoff, and stuff like this. It seems a bit trivial, but I'm going to speak for an hour about that. So I think there's lots of things to say. And I think the new motto for categorical, well, for open games should be to be not compositional game theory, but categorical game theory, and even better, structuralist game theory. Okay. So studies games by starting from what is the structure of games in the first place. So if you open a textbook about open games, sorry, about games, game theory, they're going to tell you that game theory is the study of systems of self-interested and interacting <coughs> agents. <coughs> Plural. OK. This is the definition of game theory. And so like, to even start doing game theory, you need to understand like, what is a system? of things. What is an agent? What does it mean they are self-interested? And what does it mean they're interacting? Right? So this seems an innocuous sentence and definition of game theory, but 
uh, to even understand what it means, like when, when you approach it from a structural, structuralist point of view, like you really need <laughs> to understand what is the structure of all these things. Uh, and it takes quite some effort, but I think category theory has done a wonderful job of like making us really grasp this concept better, at least when it comes to me. Uh, I, I want to add something else, which is like, <laughs> what is the study? Like, what do we want to do with the understanding of this thing? Is it just like a philosophical endeavor? Like, what is games? Why are agents doing the things they're doing? Uh, it's a bit more. Usually once we, uh, like once we arrange the game, we want to analyze it and try to like predict or classify the behaviors of agents. And so this is a Im very important thing because it ties whatever we're doing with reality in a sense, right? So I hope to also say something about that. All right, so let's see. I'm gonna start uh, by telling you what I think interaction is. So well, I should tell you first what I, like the plan of the talk, so you know what's coming. So I want to answer these questions. What is interaction, like w when it comes to game theory, I mean? What is, like, what are agents, in a sense? Self-interested agents. And, and then I'm going to tell you what are systems. And finally, what, let's say, what is study, right? So w what is that we're trying to do with these three things, right? This is going to go there. Uh, and also, let me tell you another thing I forgot. So I'm going to talk about games, but like in Glasgow, we like to talk about cybernetic systems. So. In a sense, like if I didn't tell you, if I didn't write this thing, right, you could be put so many things here, like, oh, learning is the study of system of self-interested interacting agents, where agents are like learners. I can tell you, like, control theory is the study of that, or I can tell you uh, Bayesian learning, or like all these kind of things that kind of look like each other. And people in the 60s, 70s used to call it cybernetic systems. Um, so one thing we're trying to do is trying to transcend game theory and to look at these things like as a whole, in a sense, as a, the same thing but with different manifestations. And so far we've been connecting games with like machine learning a lot because like Bruno and other people are working on that. And because like very surprisingly, the abstractions that we started using from machine learning came up with, on, with game theory very, 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 very naturally. And so like, at the end of the day, we're studying the same thing. Uh, and this is very interesting. But so much for introductory talk. So let's start with interaction. So as I told you, um, categorical game theory has been around for a while. And since the very first iteration, uh, game theory, sorry, Open games have been about um, like bidirectional transformations between pairs of sets that look like this. Okay. But to understand why this is a good idea, we first need to understand like what even are we describing again? So let me take a step back and say, like, usually, like, the super simple definition of game you find on a textbook, like, the paragraph after this is, uh, a game is a number of players and <coughs> a collection of sets, one for each player, is called the actions. And then, well, and then a utility function. Right. 
of this kind. So very, very simple. Right. It's simple. And, and the way a game works in this definition is that for some reason you have players and players picking an actions from space or possible actions they can take. And then when they do that, some god gives them uh, a number, a payoff to each of them, right? Amazing. Uh, what's missing here is all the dynamical content, like how does this happen? Like what are these actions for? Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so there's like better abstractions for that, even in classical game theory. Like, you can see games as like trees of like actions, like players that they node and they take actions, and then at the end you have payoffs, right? So players play by going down the tree, and you can prove like this can be put in this form, of course, because. You can just say, well, the actions are the possible like moves you can make uh, in the tree, and then the payoff is given by whatever is in the leaves, right? Uh, but like, and, and you see already here that basically like this attempt at adding a dynamical uh, like content to games, uh, what is this doing basically is uh, reasoning about the shape of this, right? Um, and in particular, like, we are dividing the game in stages. Like, you can think of this as the levels of the trees. And every time we play a stage, like, whatever we decide to play is going to lift a payoff from that, uh, from, like, the end of the branch to one, uh, to the node the branch is attached to, right? So if the three decides to play this, then it, it from the perspective of one is as if this payoff was here, right? As far as they know, like they would receive that payoff. So in, what, what I'm trying to say is that you can think of the utility as the end point of the game. When, when the game ends, then utilities are given. And then whatever dynamics happens at each stage of the game, the effect is simply that of lifting the payoff function one up, bam, 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 okay? Until, like, if you're here, you play something, and at some point someone gives you a payoff. So as far as you know, you're simply in interacting with a game in this form, right? So in a sense, what we are trying to do when we put dynamical content on games is opening up this payoff function, okay? By giving you ways to lift the payoff function from, like, the future to the past, okay? So that's why we're using lenses here. So uh, the first thing we, we have to recognize, let, let's keep it simple, like suppose we have, at this stage, we have Y options, right? So there's Y possible outcomes, Y is a set, okay, of the game. And at this stage, we have X options, right? And players, like, somehow decide how uh, these X options become Y options, right? Then uh, if, R is the if R to the N is a type of payoffs, here we have a function like this, that the play lifts to a function like this, right? So in a sense, what we're looking for is a way to express transformations uh, of this kind. Like you give me a payoff function on y, and some game dynamics turns it into a payoff, a payoff function on x, right? And there is a sense in which the most general form that a function like this can take is exactly a lens of this shape. Uh, sorry. So given by a function that goes from x to y, and a function goes from x times r to r, OK? So that's where lenses come from, in a sense, right? They're the most general form of this game dynamics or payoff lifting idea. Is there an n missing in the lens? Sure, yeah. Thank you. Good. Um, now, something I didn't tell you is that, OK, how this, does this happen? Players make decisions here, right? 
and decisions are somehow like not something you can see, but somehow come from the external world. So there is some like extra parameter that goes what's happening here. Extra parameter that goes here, they usually call omega. Sorry, I should call it A because that's what it corresponds in normal form. And this A is somehow is called the strategy space of players. So like players are making decisions um, based on what they see in the configurations of the game. They're gonna choose a new configuration of the game. Okay. So A is the strategy space. Uh, yeah. I have a question. Well, you said that the most general form of maps from R into the wide, R and Vx, is a lens. In but certainly not all of them are like that. Sure, so sure. The most generally I said, in a sense, is the one. <laughs> in, in what sense? So what, what, what constraint do you put on it to make that the most general? It's like, uh, this is the profound representation theorem for optics. So this is a profounder, which is Cartesian. And if you basically, if you ask that this transformation does not use the actual payoff function, but can only like precompose wise and postcompose here, then it's equivalent to say it's a Cartesian profounder, and you can say that the most general transformation between Cartesian profounders uh, are lenses. So if, if you want like this particular kind of transformation that is given by like attaching something before and doing something after, right? And doesn't actually use the encoding of the function. That's what I meant. Uh, so there is an extra parameter there, uh, and this is the action, sorry, the strategy. So this means that there's gonna be like something here, okay? Uh, and this is how we get to something else, which is parametric lenses. So uh, let me see. Let's start over. So we want to model now some uh, action that goes from x to y, and it's also parameterized by a. But we still think of it as an action from x to y. So we call this a parametric function, write it like this. OK. And what this actually means is a function of this signature, right? But the fact that we consider a on the <coughs> on the arrow and not here means that it's like this is hidden, right? We we don't see it from the outside. Um, therefore, when I told you that uh, this is the most general, like this is the form that open games think about interaction, I, I omitted to specify something else, which is like. Uh, this interaction space, a, a prime, okay. Uh, so a lens like this formally corresponds to a lens of this kind. Which again, you should think of uh, taking a payoff function, which has this shape, and lifting back to a payoff function that evaluates uh, like the stage, the the states of the of here, the states of the game at a previous stage, and the strategies of the players. Okay. Uh, now you, you might notice that I changed the payoff fun the payoff types here. Okay. So here, these these pairs of sets are uh, a set of states of the game, uh, which indeed gets transformed by the play function, and a set of payoffs at each stage of the game. So at a stage. At this stage of the game, uh, we expect payoffs of type S. At a later stage of the game, we expect payoffs of type R. So this is not something you see much in practice. Like very often, these are the same type as I showed you before. It's something that arises when you want to compose games, which is what we want to do. Because imagine like uh, we are playing chess, me and Owen, and okay, we play chess, and there's not many like payoff changes during chess, right? It's either you win, I win, or we tie, and there's nothing much happening. But suppose at the same time, Evan and David are betting on our success. Now, their payoff is going to be like some dollars, some values, some number, but our payoff is way different. But when we compose these two games to model the fact that we are playing chess, but they are playing their betting game, then you need a way to translate our outcome, which is I win, you win, or we tie to their outcome. And so this is what this, uh, sorry, 
this is what this transformation is doing, what we call the coplay. Okay, so you should imagine this is a payoff conversion mechanism. Right. So parametric lenses is what we use to describe what. Now this is a subtle point. So this is not a game. Uh, I started calling this a play lens because this lens really defined, like describes how the plays go, right? How does the play uh, unfold? And plus, how does the payoffs like also transform, like controversial, uh, in, in the opposite direction? But this does not describe the game yet. Why is it so? Uh, in reality, what we want to do when we talk about game theory uh, is talk about the agents, right? The f they happen to be interacting in some way, but really talking about the agents and the way they think about the game and the way they decide to play some strategies and the way they change this decision, seeing their outcome, uh, the outcome of such decisions in the game. So what we have to do, turns out, it's a maneuver which is very similar to what happens in gradient-based learning, in which uh, you just don't describe what the model does, like what a neural network does, because what a neural network does is not what you want to actually model. You describe how you train a neural network. So in the same way, here we're not going to describe like how the game unfolds, which is pretty boring. We want to describe how the players think about the game, right? And when we do so, it turns out that uh, we really need to like go one level up in the counterfactual, like in the causal hi hierarchy of this system. So if this describes what happens in the system, we have to describe what could have happened in the system, right? Because players are going to reason about that. They're not going to reason about, oh, I got a pay of a three. How do I change my strategy? No, this is not how games work. Uh, in game theory, players receive an entire payoff function, and based on that, decide how to vary their strategy. Okay. Now, let's see how this works. So in practice, what we do, it's an operation I call dash star, that takes uh, <coughs> it takes a, a valid set, so a set with a type of payoffs over it, and turns it into another pairs of set, pair of sets, which is of this form, okay? So now, the, given an x, I get an entire payoff function living over it, not just one payoff. And if I have a lens over it, this gets mapped to, uh, to what? So the map from Sorry. The map from x to y is going to be the same, but the map back is going to be like, I think the best way to, to write this down is the following. It's going to be this map. So what happens here is that we are given, um, we are given a payoff function here, an R, an R y, a y to r function. And we want back an, an x to s function. But as I, as I told you, composing with a lens is exactly this pullback operation for payoff functions, right? So if I stick my payoff function here, uh, let's see how to draw this. So if I have a payoff function like this, then composing it with the given lens gives me a payoff function of the desired type. So what this does is basically pre-compose, given an x, I apply f, and I apply f, and then I apply u, and then I apply f sharp back, right? So what this does is basically pulling back the payoff function. That, that's it, that's it. And, and you can show that this extends to parametric lenses by applying a thing we call the power construction. And let's see, the only difference between like this and this is that now there's going to be a parameter we have to account for. 
So let's call this. If this is the play, then when I receive an R to the Y, I do this operation here. So okay, let, let me stick with F and F sharp. So this is F, and this is basically F sharp, F. Bam. What do I get back when I do this? Now there's a parameter here, so something like a prime a. So I don't get just r to the s to the x. I get uh, s times a prime to the x times a. And there's going to be a little friend here that does the following thing. It separates in this function here, separates the s to the x part from the a prime to the a. Right? We call this the nashader, and it has this definition. So given, um, sorry, given s times a prime x times a, so if you give me a payoff function here, oh, sorry, and I didn't show you here, but the Nashader knows about x and a. So we have like given an x, given an a, and given a utility of that kind, what we do is we partially evaluate u on x and on a to get these two distinct functions. So the function we get here is um, uh, u eval projected on s evaluated at um, sorry x a bar and the other given an a we project it on a prime, it's x bar a. So see, each of, each of these uses like one argument coming from its evaluation, and the other it's fixed here, right? So the result, especially like if we look up, this is going to the player, it's going to become the observation of the player. What, what the player sees is this function here, which has, which is a function that tells them what their payoff is, given what the state of the game is, right? Ideally, they don't have control on this. They have only control of this. So now players, which are going to live up there, up here, are going to receive a payoff function that, ta that takes into account all other players' moves because these are going to decide their state of the game. All right. So yeah, so this Nashader is quite important in the sense that it produces a lot of interesting facts. So um, let me see. So this is called a Nashader. So I think the most important thing that the Nashader tells us is that When we compose, when we compose like uh, plays, I'm gonna call this play one and play two. There is a difference whether like uh, we first. So these are parametric lenses of that kind. We can first differentiate. So apply this dash star functor and get a new game, like an, an actual arena for the game. I have like x, s, and this is x, s to the x.
sorry. So if we apply it to the composite, we see that so players may like are gonna give two decisions and going to receive a payoff function that is uh, evaluating both strategies at the same time. All right. And so players here, like if I'm here and I see this. I can evaluate joint deviations, OK? So given the strategy that I played, we played A and B together, I can evaluate what it would be like if we moved to a different strategy together, right? So say we're playing uh, ha, prisoner's dilemma. We can cooperate on the fact if I had this information and we were like uh, able to communicate, then I could play. We could decide to both cooperate and be happy forever, right? In a sense, this means that when I have this kind of information, so players have access to both uh, both players' outcomes and both uh, players' st strategy space, then they can decide. They can find the Pareto optimum basically of the game, and then they can decide to do the best thing for both. But if I apply this functor separately to each and then I compose, I'm going to correct this in place because this is going to be a bit unwieldy. Otherwise, what happens is some, I get something like this. So now you see that players still play two strategies, but what they get up there is not a joint pay of functions anymore but are two different payoff functions. And there is no hope now for them to understand what would happen if they uh, were to deviate together. Because each of these functions is telling them uh, it depends on what they played to each other. So this function is going to depend on how the first player played, and this function is going to depend on how the second player played. And so now there is no way they can know what the Pareto optimum is, because they cannot fully evaluate joint deviations of the game, right? And what's and the way the Nashader like is involved is that what what relates this to uh, composites is an application of the Nashader here. So the Nashader here is going to separate. It's going to separate <coughs> the two functions again. So the Nashader is going to uh, make the players unable to cooperate and be in a coalition together, right? And the fact that this Nashader comes up uh, in this situation, I think, is very telling of like something crucial about the composition structure of games that makes them have the phenomenology we see. So the fact that, like games like Prisoner Dilemma are even possible is because you have to use this structure to separate p uh, players. And when you do so, then you have necessary information for players to cooperate and be less interesting, all right? Because uh, cooperating players would be less interesting. It would be more like learners in which like composing two learners is the same as having a big learner. But composing two players is not the same as having a big arg maxim player, right? Because Composing two players is going to introduce this asymmetry of information and all sorts of like phenomena arise from that. Um, okay, I would have loved to be a bit more specific on this. Uh, how is the time? Oh, I can. Oh, right. Okay, so I think I'm going to move on to the second part of the talk, um, which is about players and systems of players. So
So w what, what I told you about in the last part, like TLDR, is uh, there is a way to like, describe game dynamics. And we want to use some kind of functor to make this into a dynamics in to which players can uh, be attached. Okay. And so, after, so if you give me uh, a play lens, so this description of the game dynamics, uh, I do this differentiation thing, and I'm going to get something that looks like this, right? Uh, this is very confusing. I'm going to call this A. OK. Um, this is what I call an arena. Okay, it's going to have these two wires here. One is A, and the other is uh, A prime to the A. And I call this an arena because this is an interface for a player that wants to play this game, right? This dynamics will interact with this thing. Uh, but where is the player? The player is actually going to be here. So. The player is going to be another morphism, which means another dynamical thing, a system, which live, lives over the arena and tries to control it. Okay? Not that I'm saying player, not players, because there's no real distinction between one player and like, many players aggregated together. Of course, we've just seen there is a distinction like, between coalitions of players and like, competing ensembles of players. But from the point of view of compositional game theory, like two players competing are just like one weird team, okay? So we can always talk about like one player and be happy with that, knowing that inside this there could be like many players actually doing their thing. Um, and so in a sense what we want to like pinpoint now is what is, uh, what does it mean for a uh, thing here to actually constitute like a player system? which is trying to control this, which is the arena process. Right? What does it mean to be above here and to have like some kind of dynamic that we can repeat and look at and iterate and get the behavior of? Um, and most importantly, what it means to be like self-interested and what it means to be like even a player. So I'm going to first tell you like, what we usually have in these boxes. So what we usually have here, we get a payoff function. And what we produce <coughs> is another strategy. And the thing doing this conversion is called a selection function. So selection functions, which have this form, uh, where remember that A prime is a type of payoffs. It has a weird name, but it's a type of payoffs. So what we get here is a reward function. Well, I'm going to call it payoff function. And this is going to tell me like what are the agent's favorite options as evaluated by the given payoff function, right? So the archetypal archetypal example is argmax, right? When a prime is like a real number, then this is giving me a real number for every strategy, and I'm going to give you my favorite strategies based on what I like. If I like big real numbers, I'm going to give you the argmax. If I like small real numbers, I'm going to give you the argmen, and so on. So um, this is like the most common form of players uh, for classical game theory. They receive a payoff function, and they optimize it in some way, and they give me a deviation in their strategy, right? So a new strategy they're going to play the next round of the game. But the next time, they're going to play the game, right? It's a bit different. 
And you see there's like this little thing here, like there should be another parameter here, another A. And why is that there? So it turns out that in game theory, at some point, people realize they want to consider players whose preferences are not like completely known at runtime, let's say. And so there is some uncertainty or some variation in the way that the players could be behaving, right? So for example, you might have a player which, depending on their like, type, could be selfish or altruistic, right? And when we run the game, players get assigned one type by a chance, okay? So we have a thousand player and one, 500 are gonna be altruistic and 500 are gonna be selfish. But you don't know which one. And so usually this information about the type is put here so that this strategy space, so here I should like have something more complex going on that takes something like their type and extract like some kind of preference type here and then an action here, okay? So it turns out that the, like, the shape of a lens reproduces exactly this thing in which like the preferences of some, uh, the preferences of some player can depend on something else, okay? So it's not just given a payoff, I give you my favorite options, but also look at how I should make this decision. So instead of having like always the same preferences, my preferences can change as I change my like behavior, my strategy, as I evolve as a person, okay? So you can imagine, I see things, I internalize these things, and this make me a different person. I might become more altruistic because I see people around me are altruistic. I might become more selfish because I see people around me are more selfish, and so on. Anyway, um, oh, made a bit of a mistake here. This should be like this, um, but it doesn't change much. Now, um, why do I think this thing deserves to be called a system and it's not just like any random lens? I'm going to restore this thing. Um, I'm going to tell you very, very quickly because time is running out. Like about what I think system look like, systems look like. So for me, systems have this shape here. They have, first of all, you decide what their interface with the world is. And then, haha, wrong direction. And then they have another boundary, which is given in a specific shape. So this is a space of states. And this is a space of changes for the state, say of state. So examples are like S is a set and TS is again S. So given a state, all my other like I can change state by going to any other state. Or given an S, which is now like, say a manifold, TS is literally the tangent space. So my changes can be like some other, my changes are tangent vectors of that space uh, at, a, at a given point, and so on. Uh, what we're going to see now is like a variation on this in which you have this, but this map here is going to have type, uh, it, it has an effect. So as type, um, okay, S times I to some like S, but there is a little monadic effect here. And this is where 
this erasure comes from. Okay, you can think of this as it goes to A, but this 2 to the A is really like, it means non-deterministically A, right? So in a sense, the space of changes is S, but in a much deeper sense, the space of changes is whatever monad we choose applied to S, right? So in this case, it's going to be like a set of A's. Uh, or you can think of distributions over A or things like that. So this notion of system, by the way, comes from Myers. Uh, and he has a big framework of categorical system theory that tells us like how <coughs> systems are like should be from a categorical point of view. And in particular, uh, he has this idea that like we can arrange processes in double categories. where vertical uh, maps are lenses, so arrows are lenses, and pro arrows are, sorry, horizontal maps are charts, which are like lenses, but with, like literally with the backward map reversed again. Uh, and the idea is now that these things represent maps between like processes which are given by lenses, okay? And these things are indexing through of unequal systems are indexing actual systems. So if you give me, uh, uh, let's be a bit more concrete, sorry. Now if you give me an object, I'm going to give you a category of systems over it with that interface whose maps are are given by squares like this of a certain shape. And OK, so this is what I want to do for games. So when I say uh, system of agents, I want to say these two things. I want to say I consider this to be systems, oh, sorry, to be agents. And I want to say these are uh, going to be maps with interface, the arena, living over it, okay? So what I want to do is turn this thing, which is going from a double category of arenas into a double cat, into profunters, basically. It's called the cis funter. I want to turn it into something else that goes from uh, a triple category of arenas, <laughs> I'm gonna call this arenas prime, into something more sophisticated. And I'm just gonna give you the idea of how this works. So now arenas are going to be arranged into, I'm going to arrange arenas into a triple category where arenas are, sorry, parametric lenses are the transverse morphisms, horizontal morphisms, sorry, objects are still like pairs of sets like this, more like polynomials or your preferred boundary for a lens-like thing. Uh, let me call this like, and for simplicity, let's say here, vertical maps are just identities. But you could be more ambitious. Uh, so we have <coughs> Three kind of one cells, trivial one, charts, parametric lenses. 
and then these are going to be arranged in can be arranged in three types of two cells. Uh, okay, let let me do this. So these two, this which are called horizontal two cells, are uh, are going to give you squares of this kind. So these are squares of the same kind we've seen before, but now here I have some kind of parameter living in the circle, and there is a chart also between this, the parameters, okay? So this is going to tell me how this parametric lens is, can be simulated by this other parametric lens, given that uh, I have a representation of their input-output uh, boundaries mediated by this chart and a representation of the parameters given by this chart, okay? So this maps this parametric process into this other parametric process. Now vertically instead, uh, let's throw this here. I have something which is much simpler. Sorry, I have to delete this or you will not understand. So here I have another parametric lens with its own set of parameters. And here now consider lenses, okay? So this is the, the other interesting thing. So you should think of this as there is some parametric lens here, and it has an open interface, and I re-index it along this, fun, uh, this lens that I gave you to give me another parametric lens. So this two cell is completely determined by this uh, filling, which is given by a lens. And like the two cells we get in the front are pretty boring because these are just, if these are identities, these are just identities. Uh, sorry. Ah, uh, sorry, people. Plus, minus, plus, minus, minus, plus, plus, minus. Now, how do all of this fit together if we have three of this, if we have a cube made of these cells? Uh, it means we have another chart here. Um, this has to be, let's call this E minus E plus with parametric lens here. And down here I have, no, charts going into the same. Mm. and a parametric here. So you see that here, horizontal two cell is filled by a chart between the parameters. This is filled by a lens between the parameters. And this on top is also filled by a chart. So you see that the red square is a square, again, in the double category of lenses and charts, which now relates all the parameters of these four arrows. And in particular, it tells me how this system, which is over this arena, can be simulated in this system, which is over this arena. Okay. So um, if you define systems to be given by this kind of cells, so like players with a selection procedure, uh, you can prove that this First of all, compose. So when you stack two of these next to each other because you compose their arenas, like 
something like this. you can prove that when these are put together, they still have the same form. And in particular, like the selection function that like the composite player we have is denoted by the list and it's called the Nash product of these two selections. And uh, you can prove something else that is the most important thing that if you take this face of the cube to be completely trivial, sorry, do this in red. So it means that on the left we have the trivial stationary system. Then the cubes into a given game, so now imagine this has the shape x, s of x, s, sorry, x, s of x, y, r of y, y, r of y. And this is like in red, you have a under a prime. And here you have a, a. So this is the arena of a game with a player over it, which is a system over it, then cubes from this trivial system to this system correspond exactly to Nash equilibrium of that system. So in particular, you're going to have to choose here a little a. You're going to have to choose here, uh, let me think, an x, which is an initial state of the game, an r to the y which is a utility function for the game. And the, this, this choice of an X and a U and a strategy A will be a cube in this triple category. So it will be a well-defined morphism from the stationary system into the game, if and only if, so it's well-defined, if and only if uh, A is a Nash equilibrium when uh, initial state is x bar and utility payoff function is u. OK, so given a context for the game. Yeah, yeah. Given a context for the game, this, the only possible morphisms into this are given by Nash equilibrium. So this explains how systems are games. Uh, games are systems, sorry. <laughs> uh, in particular, players are systems over uh, an interface, which is the arena of the game, and how this can be arranged in a single big compositional structure that I call a cybernetic system theory, because it's the compositional structure of other cybernetic things. And since I didn't talk about this, <laughs> so <laughs> I wanted to tell you this thing is like, uh, once you have this big thing of cybernetic system theory or like more simply a categorical uh, system theory without the cybernetic part, then there is a canonical way to study behavior of this thing. So you're given a system and you wanna study like how this system will do things like Forget about the dynamics. Well, what am I going to see when the system runs? Uh, and in particular, you, you can study like the way that systems can like embed in other systems and give you in this way like a notion of behavior of a certain type into the other system. So what, what, I, what I show you here is a behavior of trivial type into a given system. And this kind of behavior of trivial type is a fixed point of the system. Okay, so if, if I give you a system, there is a notion of behaviors of that type into other systems. But in general, like, I can study given, like, a system I want to study, I can hit it with a behavior functor that's going to give me, like, what are the behaviors that the system will, will show. And all the functoriality and all the complicated math are going to give me ways to compose the behaviors and study them compositionally. So this is all to get at the fact that 
uh, if we can express Nash equilibria or other solution concepts or other behavioral concepts that come from game theory in this way, then we can all, like we can find automatically all sorts of nice compositional formula for this, which are going to be respected by composition, tensor of games, or like if I want to like quotient out some things in this game, so I want to like map a game into a simpler game, then I know that the behavior is going to be preserved in a certain way, and so on and so on. So all of this is going to like be the plan for the next month. Uh, find out how this formula, formula came out from this formalism and clarify how this formalism works for more general systems. Thank you for listening. <laughs>
Any more questions? Bruno? So yeah, I've got a question. Um, so I'm thinking about the way interaction works here. Um, and I'm just wondering whether I realized something wrong or, or whether it's... So we have an agent and, and an arena and um, we can study behavior by looking at this uh, cubes. Uh, and for example, for the fixed point, right, the, the type of behaviors is included by the type of the cube from this initial stuff to the um, but does, this doesn't allow us to, like the way, imagine again, the, the agent does something, then the environment responds, the agent does something, then environment, but the environment's response is really fixed in some way here. Um, well, in a fixed point behavior, yes, but in longer behaviors, Right, so I suppose like, what the hmm. strategy of the environment is then fixed. It's not like the environment has their own things. Mm. It seems like it's, it's somehow the environment is fixed on what it's going to do there. Um, <laughs> yeah, it depends what you mean. That's not the case. Uh, like, it depends what you mean by environment. You mean these two things? Yeah, that, that sort of sounds like what the agent receives and what yeah. the co-play, the, the co-state. Yeah. Right. And what do you mean by fixed? Uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, maybe I'll, yeah. Because like, this is not an interactive transformation. This is a simulation, so let's see what this looks like. Like, can I find a way to reproduce this in this? So that's why I think there's yeah. not much interaction going on. Yeah. But like you can still have something that changes through time because like, so these are fixed. But if if you had something like, I don't know, uh, R plus, yeah. then yeah. you would have for every t in R plus, you would have a different like u t here. So you can have like a payoff function that changes through time, or equivalently a state that changes through time. You know. Yeah, right, it seems like somehow in this simulation it's encoded what the outside of the agent is. Yeah, so it's like when you simulate, you say, okay, you're going to observe this at the boundaries. Yeah. Can, can I, can, what, what, what do I know about what happens inside? Okay, and a follow-up question. So did you, like people say this very obnoxious thing that a monad is just a monad is a category. <laughs> can I one-up it and say, oh, Nash equilibria, you mean the initial cube? Uh, <laughs> a good question. So it's like, as, as there's, there's a catch, catch has this a universal property? That's your question. Well, yeah, I don't think that this has a universal property. Oh, right. This is just I think this is just general. saying the Nash equilibriums are the generalized elements of mm -hmm. uh, open game. <laughs> are the global elements global of the game. Elements, right. Oh, I like this way of putting it. That's how we're going to sell pe people yeah, yeah. categorical game theory. Cool. Yeah. Why don't we thank the again? <laughs>